Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Seb. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to talk about um, some recent work that actually stems all the way back to the 80s, like most of the work that we're hearing about in this conference. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how we can scale up deep learning using a technique um, on evolution computation. Uh, this is the idea, that we optimize the neural network uh, using evolutionary algorithms. Um, so there are two parts of this talk and two parts of this whole field of evolution optimization and neural networks. Uh, There's the traditional role, one we started with. Back in the 90s, uh, we started evolving neural networks, and other people have done that too. Um, and the idea there was uh, to figure out how to utilize recurrency uh, to solve PUMDP type of reinforcement learning tasks. Uh, and those are hard to train with backpropagation, but if you use evolution and you evolve both the structure, like this very complicated topology, and the weights of the neural network, you can actually tackle these PUMDB tasks, partially observable tasks. Um, now, the power then comes from the recurrency, that the network is recurrent, you can memorize things, and you can deal with such tasks. Now, very recently, pretty much just this year, a new area has emerged in this area of neuroevolution, or evolving neural networks, and that is the optimization of these deep learning architectures. Uh, then there, you use evolution to optimize the components, the hyperparameters, and the topology, the structure of the network. But you still do training with uh, backpropagation or stochastic gradient descent. And the power of this approach comes from the complexity of the architecture, combining these two mechanisms, optimization and learning. Uh, and overall, neuroevolution that allows you to solve um, more challenging tasks with neural networks. So I'm going to talk about both of those a little bit. I'll start with the more traditional POMDP type of uh, neuroevolution. Um, these are tasks where the decision maker has to make a sequence of decisions uh, in order to achieve some, some good final state. For instance, you might be controlling a rocket, you might be controlling a, an agent in a game, um, and you only get rewards after a long period of time. You have to play the whole game before you know whether you win or lose, for instance. And so we only know how well we're doing, we don't have gradients, uh, but we know when we're doing well. So many re real world problems are like that, many uh, tra traffic control problem types, uh, computer manufacturing process optimization. In many such cases, you don't know what the optimum actions are, but you know when you're doing, doing well. Uh, so here's a typical neural network evolved for such a task. Uh, this might be a game agent, actually, in a video game. It's sensing opponents and the space around it, and at the output, it makes some decisions on how to move and, and how to interact with the environment. Uh, so important part of it is that we evolve the recurrency here inside the network. That gives you the memory, and the memory then gives you the ability to deal with PUMDB. Uh, so the basic idea of evolve, how to evolve neural networks is to uh, evolve the connection weights, the very fundamental way. You have a fully connected network, recurrent network perhaps, and you just evolve the weights. Um, now, the chromosomes encode the weights in some linear fashion, so you can do crossover and mutation, as you normally do in evolution. Uh, and then each network is decoded from that um, genome representation, put in the environment, and evaluated. How well is it doing in this task? And then you reproduce. You take the best networks, cross over, mutate, throw away the bad ones, keep the good ones, and continue until you have networks to solve the task. So that's a very basic idea, taking inspiration from biology and evolution computation. But you can do more. Uh, you can evolve the structure of the network itself. Uh, like in this method, NEAT, in Ken Stanley's group, um, the idea is to complexify. You start with very simple network architectures first and gradually make them more complex, adding recurrency, adding more nodes. Uh, and when you do that, you are building ability to perform more complex tasks. And it turns out also that uh, even if you had a complex architecture to begin with, it would be very difficult to evolve its weights. You can only find the right weights if you increase the complexity gradually. So, over the years, we've done a lot um, with this approach, many applications. Uh, the typical applications are various control tasks of various vehicles and robotic control tasks, uh, game playing agents, and artificial life. And I'll just show you one real briefly. This is work by Dan Lesson at UT. Uh, he's evolving these virtu evolved virtual creatures. Uh, these little critters that work in this micro world. Uh, this one is uh, evolved to do fight or flight. When there's a good object, it fights it, it goes there and jumps on it, and then the object sometimes changes into a bad object, it, is, it tries to stay away from it. Um, so the structure of the network as well as the weights are evolved. Uh, and what, something interesting happens here, that this kind of behavior that you evolve under such constraints, it actually looks believable. You really root for the guy, and you're kind of worried that he might get hit. 
Uh, and, and this, okay, and eventually he did. Uh, and this actually really works. We use the same approach in a competition called Bot Price, where the goal was to create an agent that would be indistinguishable from humans. So it's a Turing test for game bots in Unreal Tournament. And uh, over five years, we improved the agent and eventually got there where it was 50% judgment human or machine. So it's indistinguishable from humans. Um, all right. Now, still, if you look at the behavior of this agent, it's, it's not that complex. It's mostly reacting to what it's seeing. It's mostly tactical, not strategic. And of course, we'd like to do better, implement strategic behavior. And here's where we can use what's currently very popular, was, was uh, created a long time ago, LSTMs. Uh, they give us uh, ability to memorize or remember things from further back. I mean, these networks that I showed you so far, they are recurrent, they have memory, but the memory fades very quickly. With LSTMs, we can have longer memories and then hopefully scale up to uh, strategic behavior. Okay, so here's a study uh, we just did uh, very recently. Uh, Lee at UT uh, built a neural network to play poker. Uh, and here we have 10 LSTMs who watch the games being played. I mean, what's the, uh, the state of the game, um, the hands that are dealt and the cards that are, are seen. Uh, but it also watches the opponent. There's just one LSTM that's, that's following what the opponent is doing. Uh, and this, net, this part of the network is, is uh, flushed after every game. This one is uh, flushed only after every opponent. Uh, and that means that here we are developing a strategy, uh, a behavior, tactical behavior, what to do in this, this particular game. But here we actually observe what the opponent is doing. And we can then modulate our decisions based on what we learn about the opponent. And indeed, that's all there is to it. We evolve these LSTMs like any other neural networks, evolve their weights, uh, and then there's a decision-making uh, system on top. And this system evolves to utilize the flaws in the opponent uh, strategy. So here are four basic strategies, one that often folds, one that often uh, calls, another one that often raises, and one that just follows the statistics um, of the game blindly. And it actually, this system does really well in adapting to the different opponents. Uh, these are um, blind binds, uh, this higher number is better. And it turns out that it actually adapts and plays better against these opponents than a state-of-the-art poker playing uh, program, Slumbot. Uh, so there's a big advantage in adapting uh, and your strategy against your opponent, and evolving a single, single LSTM allows you to do that. And it's a really powerful application of this idea of LSTMs. All right, so now the, let's start, move on to the new role uh, of evolving neural networks, and that is the optimization of these deep learning architectures that are uh, currently um, so popular here at this conference and otherwise. Um, so deep learning has been successful by scaling up neural networks. The networks that do a good job in this task, currently vision and language, for instance, they are very, very large. Lots of layers, uh, large layers, convolution, um, many different types of layers. Uh, so this has become a problem. These network architectures are very complex, and it takes a long time to come up with an architecture that really works. Uh, and still in this conference, we see a lot of um, presentations that are focusing on coming up with the right architecture for the, to for the task. Um, so all of these matters, what components you're using, what the overall topology architecture is, what the hyperparameters are, and we can optimize those. Uh, now, this year, these ideas have started to emerge, combining evolution with uh, uh, deep learning. Uh, this is, for instance, the architecture from DeepMind, Cassandra um, Fernando and, uh, and others, uh, where they use a neural network to generate the weights of another neural network, that's a deep learning network, autoencoder, uh, and then Lamarckian evolution to encode the uh, weight changes back. Uh, Marcus Hutter has, and his group has done a lot of work in, uh, in evol evolving the hyperparameters of deep learning network and achieving the state of the art in many domains, in many benchmarks. Um, but it, this requires a lot of computation. I mean, imagine training a deep learning network. It takes two days normally, and if you're really trying to beat the state of the art, three weeks maybe. Uh, and I tried to evolve those architectures. And you have a population of 100, you have to run hundreds of generations, and you're going to exhaust all the computing that's available in, in the universe, pretty much. Uh, so that's a key resource that we've been building at Sentient, um, where I'm uh, currently on sabbatical, uh, Sentient Technologies. Um, there's a way of achieving that such computational um, ability by harnessing the available compute around the world in internet cafes and various uh, farms. Um, when they're idle, we can use it for deep learning. Um, so 
we have currently a machine that incorporates uh, 2 million CPUs. It's used mostly for another application, stock trading, uh, but also 5,000 GPUs, and that's most used for deep learning. Uh, and the numbers are staggering. I mean, with 2 million CPUs, we've been able to evolve stock traders, 40 trillion of them in one year. Um, you know, there must be some good stock traders. We have 40 trillion of them, even if they're random, but they're not. They evolved. Uh, and with the uh, 5,000 GPUs, the peak performance of that machine is five, five petaflops. That's the sixth most powerful computer in the world. Now we're talking. Now we can start doing evolution, finally. Um, all right. So what have we done so far? This is work in progress. Um, initial approach is to use NEAT to evolve these network architectures and hyperparameters. Um, and it uh, results in more complex architectures. One interesting thing is that NEAT likes to make these multiple pathways and gets benefit from that, which is kind of an interesting insight from evolution. Uh, but we can do better. Uh, we can evolve components at the same time as, as the architecture and hyperparameters. So for instance, in the inception net, there's a component that's repeated. And we can use the same approach. We evolve the components in one evolutionary um, run uh, or one evolutionary process. And then we evolve the blueprint, how you connect those modules together in another process. Uh, and indeed, you can do that in vision and LSTM uh, in language. So here's a quick result we did in Cypher 10. We start with networks that are very simple. And then we evolve their topology by utilizing those components. All three in this network are the same. And here we have one uh, different component, and these two are the same. Oh, sorry, actually, these two are the same. Uh, and this results in performance that's comparable to the best hand-designed architectures. And evolution discovered that without us having to spend a lot of time uh, fine-tuning it. Um, here's another study. Results are just from yesterday, as a matter of fact. We talked about things from the 90s. We talked about things from last night. Um, so Aditya Raval, uh, who's here at this conference, evolved LSTM units, the architecture of how to connect the units together, and, uh, and then Blueprint uh, builds layers. And he discovered with evolution that it's a good idea to have this kind of a connection, connecting two memory cells together. Um, and there may be many others. This is just work that we started, but this already gave an improvement of 2% in the language modeling task in perplexity. Um, so in the future, indeed, the plan is to utilize dark cycle. And if you're doing this kind of work, you might have other resources available, but let's use them. Uh, computing is a wonderful thing if you have enough of it. Uh, and we can extend this approach in many ways. We can extend the search space for deep learning, have more different components, residual learning, uh, timing connections, as we heard about yesterday. Um, and also, we can utilize ensembles. It's a really great idea with evolution, because you can evolve for performance, but you can also evolve for diversity. And if you evolve for diversity, you should have an ensemble that works really well. And as we've seen, ensembles are a very powerful way of increasing performance. Uh, and finally, we'd like to use these uh, components together, deep learning and LSTMs, to, to build something. For instance, image captioning. Um, it's a very great application to start with. Um, OK, so to conclude, I believe that evolution neural networks is a very powerful approach uh, for POMDP. We've seen that over the last couple of decades, discover robust, believable behavior in all these domains. But also, more uh, timely, it makes it possible to build much more complex deep learning architectures than as, uh, is possible otherwise. Uh, and we have to evolve maybe three different levels of structure, components, and hyperparameters. Uh, but then we can apply it to many different tasks. We have a mechanism for designing learning machines automatically. Okay, thank you.